Chapter 27 of Heat, page 198. It wasn't just El Grande and Ellie. Carlos was a couple of steps behind, walking with Mr. Gibbs of the ACS, and another man Michael didn't recognize, but one who had official person written all over him, all of them walking straight for Michael. Michael knew he couldn't have moved, even if he tried, so he stayed right where he was, just inside the fence, about even with first base, El Grande moving pretty well on his crutches, Michael thought, as graceful with them as he was on the mound. Stopped a few free in front of Michael, Michael feeling as if he were towering over him the way he had a blue barrier outside Yankee Stadium. So, El Grande said, you're the one who has been making my daughter so miserably lately. He took his time with miserable breaking the word up into pieces, four pieces. Michael looked at Ellie and said, I didn't mean to. She smiled that smile at him. I know, she said. Then Michael looked at his brother. Carlos, I don't understand. Carlos smiled. Let them tell you. Show you, he means, El Grande said. Give it to him, he said to his daughter. From behind her back, she produced the envelope, handed it to Michael. I believe you've been looking for this, she said. Open it, Miguel, Carlos said. Michael did. At the top of the thick piece of paper were words in bold, black type. Cuban Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Underneath was this, Certificate of Birth. And underneath that was his name, Michael Victor Arrow. And the date of his birth, and at the bottom was a signature that he knew was his father's. Michael looked at Ellie. This? It's real? It's real, she said. The man Michael didn't recognize stepped forward now, put out his hand. Michael shook it. Son, he said, my name is Steve Kane. I'm the chief executive officer of the Little League Baseball in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Michael said, nice to meet you, sir. I just want to tell you I'm sorry I didn't know about your predicament sooner, Mr. Kane said. We want our best players in the field, not the sidelines. Mr. Kane gave a quick look over his shoulder in the general direction of the Giants bench. And Justin Stad, especially when they are at the age they say they are. Michael said, I still don't understand. Then how? The adults looked at one another like each one was waiting for the other to say something. It was Ellie who did the talking for all of them. I don't have time to tell you the whole story now, but basically, my father gave me your note that same day. I got a call from Manny. He told me everything. It was nothing, really, Manny said. Michael turned round. Manny was right behind him. Of course, had his back, just like always. Michael said, you got her number? I tell you how, Manny said, but I have to kill you. Michael looked down at the birth certificate again. It was shaking in his hand like a leaf. You did this, sir? Let's just say I still know some people in Havana, he said. Who knows some people, Mr. Kane said. Long story short, Mr. Gibbs said, here we are. Now, El Grande said to Michael, are you going to be standing here talking all night, or are you going to warm up? Michael didn't even have his spikes with him. Carlos pulled them out of his bag he was holding. Got him right here, little brother, he said. He handed Michael the spikes. Michael handed him the birth certificate. As Justin's dad came running over, saying, Now just wait a second here. Michael was sitting on the ground next to Manny, trying to get his hands to stop shaking, long enough to tie the stupid laces on his spikes. Justin's dad was on the other side of the fence, the failed side, and seemed to be talking to them as a group. El Grande, Mr. Kane, Mr. Gibbs, Mr. Mignana, too. You can't just send the kid into the middle of the game, Justin's dad said. Mr. Kane was the one smiling now. Sure I can, he said. He stared at Justin's dad for what was like an hour, and then said, You're the one who did this. It wasn't just me. You wrote the letter, Mr. Kane said, didn't you? I was just trying to make sure the rules were enforced. His face was redder now than ever in the Little League baseball game seemed to make it. 
I didn't want us to get into another Danny Almonte situation. Big of you, Mr. Kane said. Michael thought the head of the Little League was looking at Justin's dad like something he just noticed at the bottom of his shoe. Michael said to Manny, you could have at least told me you talked to her. I didn't want to spoil the movie, he said. Manny stood up then, pulled Michael up <coughs> with him. Now shut up and pitch, he said. By the time Michael had warmed up, there were two outs in the bottom of the third. Nobody on for the Clippers. Bobby Cameron was due up. Listen, Mr. M was saying to the players he gathered around him behind the bench. Somebody's going to have to come out for Michael to go in. Any volunteers? Every member of the Clippers raised a hand, except for one, Manny. He shrugged at Michael. You need me, he said. Nobody on the clip is moved. All those arms still in the air, willing to give up a spot for Michael. Well, that narrows it down, Mr. M said. Bobby Cameron said, let him go in for me, coach, right here. He looked at Michael and said, Michael already got me my swing. He put out his fist and Michael tapped it with his own. Mr. M, you bring all your bat arrow. Always, Michael said. He wanted to run to the plate to get his hacks off Justin, but he made himself walk instead like he had all day. Digging in, he remembered what Justin had done to Manny with two outs and nobody on in the first. He reminded himself to stay loose. Don't forget you're facing a loose cannon, he thought. Somehow Justin still had that smirk face going for him, like he was telling everybody that his attitude about this game wasn't going to change just because Michael was in it. Michael took a fastball for strike one, then two balls, the second one inside and tight, backing Michael off the plate. He's trying to set me up, Michael thought. He was. Justin tried to throw Michael his very best fastball now, his number one, daring Michael just off the bench to catch up with it. Michael was on it. He made sure not to overswing, like he was making Justin's power work for him. The pitch was a little bit toward the outside corner, and Michael went with it all the way, lacing it up the alley between the center fielder and the left fielder. By the time the ball made it its way back to the infield, Michael was on third and standing up triple. Michael, Michael single cleanly, cleanly to center. Michael could have walked home. Kel got thrown out, stealing to the end of the inning. No matter, they were on the board, top of the fourth. Michael stood on the mound, ball in his left hand again, rolling it around in his palm like it was his lucky charm, as a giant second baseman dug in to his face him. Not feeling anything like the season might be over in a few innings, feeling like it was just getting started. Manny put one finger. Michael went into his wind-up, his all grande motion, burned in strike one, the giant second baseman taking all the way. Yeah, he overthrew the next two pitches, like he wanted to throw both of them 180. One of them nearly went over Manny's head, but then he came back to strike the kid. On the mound, he saw Ellie jump up from her seat in the first row of the stands. Then he couldn't help himself. He looked at El Grande to see if he'd gotten any reaction out of him. The great man was slowly nodding in approval. Oh, yeah. Whether Justin was shaken now that Michael was in the game or whether the Clippers had rediscovered their confidence, they got two more runs off Justin in the bottom of the fourth. He walked both Manny and Anthony with one out, and then Chris Norris doubled them both home. I'm telling you, we're in the head now, Manny said after the inning, still out of breath. Then he grinned at Michael. And boy, is there a lot of room up there. Michael, overthrowing again, too excited now that the Clippers were back in the game, walked the leadoff man to start the Giants' fifth. The next guy, their right fielder, tried to sneak bunt toward third. At the half sacrifice bunt and the half trying to bunt for a base hit. Manny didn't even think about yelling. First base, which would have been telling Michael to go for a short out. <clears throat> Just watched as Michael barehanded the ball over by the line, planted, and threw a perfect strike to Kel, covering second. Mikel brought the ball back to him at the mound. He took his hand out of the glove, flexed it a couple of times, and said, Okay, that hurt. 
Rakul Kell said. We're going to win this sucker, right? Sounds like a plan, Michael said. Two more strikeouts to the end of the inning. When they all got to the bench, Manny gathered everybody around him, the way Mr. M had when he asked for a volunteer to sit out when Michael went into the game. Let's win this right here, he said. Kel said, sounds like a plan. Right here, right now, Maria said. It started with Nate Collins single to the left. Now Zach Frazier, bunting on his own, tried to put one down the first baseline. Justin was all over it the way Michael had just been. Maybe that play was still in his head. Maybe he wanted to show he could get the guy out a second way Michael just had. Only rushed the throw, and the ball sailed over the shortstop's head into the center field. And if the center fielder hadn't been backing the play up the way you're supposed to, the Clippers would have gotten back to the 5-4 and four right there. Justin paced around on the mound, talking to himself a little too loud, like he was broadcasting himself over the PA system. You jerk, he yelled. Manny poked Michael, who was standing in on the deck circle. Finally, he gets it, Manny said. Second and third. Nobody out. Michael coming to bat. Justin's dad called him and came to the mound. Justin finally lowered his voice, but Michael could see that the two of them were arguing, not able to decide who looked angrier or whose head looked more likely to explode. The only thing Michael heard before the umpire broke up the father-son chat was this. I know how to pitch. Really? Somebody else must have put those guys on base. Whatever, Dad. Michael stood there at the plate, taking it all in, waiting for them to finish. Michael hated all the little ritual big league batters had when they got ready to hit. Ones that he saw guys in the little league imitating all the time. When Manny did it, he wanted to laugh, just because he knew it was for for show, because so much of Manny was show. But Michael wanted to groan when he sees guys playing with their batting gloves and putting out a hand to the umpire, like telling him to wait while they dug in, then adjusting their helmet one last time, like they were a football running back about to carry the ball into the line. For one thing, he didn't even wear batting gloves. He thought the coolest guy in the big leagues were the few who still didn't. But he wanted to make Justin wait, see if he could rattle him just a little more. So he bent down, picked up some dirt, rubbed it in his hands, then regripped the bat. Then he took his stance, not looking at Justin until the last possible moment, at which point he felt like he was watching a cartoon and could actually see smoke coming out of his ears. Justin was that mad. Ball one wasn't even close to being a strike, way outside. Ball two was up in Michael's eyes. Michael took a deep breath. Practice what you preach now, Michael told himself. Patience. Then it was completely quiet for him. That place he got on the mound where he couldn't hear a thing. Just him and the ball. Justin rocked into his motion. The next sound Michael or anybody else heard in Macomb Dam Park was the piping of a TPX bat making contact with the ball. He pulled a line drive over the first baseman's head the kid not even having time to get his glove up until the ball was past him and rolling toward the right field corner. By the time their right fielder picked it up, Nate had scored easily. The right fielder made a good relay throw, and the second baseman made a nice throw to the plate, but they had no shot at getting Zach. Clippers 5, Giants 5, still nobody out. Michael took third on the throw to the plate. When he got there, he looked at, El- at Ellie. She gave him the kind of underhanded fist pump Tiger Wood was famous for. Michael just nodded. Poppy always said, act like you've done it before. Justin, his control still shaky, walked Kel on five pitches. But to his credit, he gathered himself then and struck at Maria. Kel stealing second on the strike third. Michael was still on third. The game was still tied. Manny up. Michael had to put a hand over his mouth because he didn't want anybody to see him, smiling at a time like this. He couldn't help it as he watched his friends go through all the little routines, tightening the Velcro on both his batting gloves, taking his helmet off as he wiped what Michael was pretty sure was imaginary sweat off his forehead, looking over to the Clippers stand as he did, then over at the Giants bench, finally adjusting the jerk. 
Michael watched all of this and knew exactly what Manny was thinking, and what he was thinking was that he was in heaven. It was all about him now, as he was playing the scene for all of its worth, like he was Uncle Timo. He got his bat back and gave one quick look toward third. Not to Mr. M, not looking for any kind of signs, at Michael. Manny winked. Then he lined up the first pitch he saw from Justin in the middle so hard it nearly took Justin's head off. Clipper six, Giants five. Three outs away, Manny said after Anthony lined up the shot to the end of the inning, the game was still 6-5. Sharp and catch, Michael said as Manny finished putting his catcher's gear on. Bobby Cameron was offered to warm up Michael, but he said he'd wait. When Manny had to, he could get his shin guards, chest protectors, mask back on so fast. You felt like you were watching one of the NASCAR's pit stops. Manny ignored Michael, nodding at the stadium across the way instead. Three outs, and we're... And we are there, he said. Manny, Michael said. We've all had to deal all summer about talking about that. So when I say shut up, I mean shut up. Manny said, I was just saying. Don't be saying anything, Michael said. How about how many else? How about anything? Baseball gods are always telling me about. They're hanging on every word right now. You're always stuffling me, Manny said, popping up off the bench, ready to go. I wish, Michael said. Michael ran out to the mound. Held up four fingers to Manny, four pitches, all he would need to get warmed up. When he was finished, Manny threw down to Kell at second. Michael watched his teammates throw the ball around the infield and thought, three innings ago, I would have done for the season and now. Now, he wasn't even going to think about how close they were. Just pitch, he told himself. The Giants were at the bottom of their order. Mr. M had showed him in the scorebook, as Michael required some kind of written proof. Number eight hitter, number nine, leadoff man. It meant they would have to get two guys out for Justin to even get another at bat. The first batter was their right fielder, a short kid with long curly hair coming out of the back of his helmet. With two strikes, it was almost as if he closed his eyes on Michael's fastball, somehow getting a bat on it. A slow roller passed the mound right at Maria. She had more time than she thought to make a play, but tried to barehand the ball instead of gloving it. She dropped it on the first try, panicked when she finally picked it up, threw wildly past Anthony Fierro. The ball rolled at the fence behind him, the runner on second. Ninth batter now, their second baseman. Michael's height, which meant tall for a second baseman in the Little League. Big swing, Michael remembered. They must have had him in the ninth spot to give them some pop at the bottom of the order. He had hit a shot earlier in the game off Anthony that Nate had been had made a great running. Number nine hitter from the bench. Michael loved Mr. M, but he always hated when coaches did that. And... They did it all the time in the Little League because it was usually their way of saying, this guy can't hit. Every time one of them did it, Michael couldn't help himself. He found himself looking at the batter's face, knowing how bad it made the kid feel. Justin's dad had the big guy squared to bunt. Maybe figuring his best chance to tie the game was to get the runner on second over to third, even if he did sacrifice an out to do it. The kid bunted the first pitch, but much too hard, between Maria and Anthony. Maria started for it. So did Anthony. Then both of them stopped at the same moment, thinking the other was going to get it. By the time Michael picked it up, it had died in the infield grass, short of the dirt, and everybody was safe. First and third, nobody out. Michael never showed anybody up on the field, ever, no matter how badly they messed up. But he was hot now, really hot. They were so close. He walked off the mound towards second base, trying to to look calm, rubbing the ball up hard, took a deep breath. Corazon, he said to himself in a soft voice, heart. Then turned back around to see Manny walking toward the mound. Even though Manny But it was too late to stop him. When Manny got to Michael he said, I've got a plan in case you're interested. Shoot, nah, he said. We can't shoot Maria, she's too cute. 
jokes, Michael said. Even now, strike one, strike two, strike three. That's my plan, he said to Michael, handing him the ball. He threw strike one, high heat. The kid on the first stole second, Manny not even risking a throw down. Michael didn't sweat it, though. He could see the leadoff man had no shot at his fastball. Strike three, he knew when he released it, was the hottest pitch he'd thrown all night. Manny stepped out of the front of the plate, chucked the run, and zipped the, the ball back to Michael and said, 8-0, in case you're interested. Michael didn't have to be told. He threw three more, pretty much like the one past the next hitter. Two outs now, Justin coming to play. Like Manny had told him in the apartment this morning, this was the way things were supposed to work out. Michael looked around. Everybody in the bleachers behind the Clippers bench was standing. Ellie, the quiet girl, the shy girl, put her two fingers in her mouth to let out a whistle that was louder than a crossing guard's. It made him put his glove in front of his face and smile. He almost felt like laughing. He, always, he almost felt like laughing. That's how happy the sight of her made him feel, even knowing there was still work to be done, one more out to get. Michael was where he was supposed to be finally. It was him against Justin and maybe him against all the other people who didn't want him to be here or across the street ever or even Williamsport. Michael knew the game wasn't over yet. Knew enough about sports to know that Justin was out was no sure thing. He already seen how fast things could go wrong earlier in the inning, but he was fine with all of that because this was the way it was supposed to be, the way it always supposed to be, his best against the other guys. He checked the runners, even though he knew they weren't going anywhere. Then he blew strike one past Justin, who was so late that his swing, Michael thought he was trying to get a head start on strike two. Manny didn't come out of the crouch, just got back into Michael's fast the way Michael looked when he was going good, and he was going good now. He let it rip, strike two, one strike away. He thought for maybe one second about wasting the next one, getting Justin to chase it. But why wait? He waited long enough. All he'd, <clears throat> waited for was about to happen. Only now the ball was back in his hand. He allowed himself a quick look over to stand over the stands again, looking at El Grande this time. Michael saw him nod. He took a deep breath, went into his windup, kicked his right leg toward the sky, and one last time let the ball fly. Pure heat. Ball game over. They were going to the stadium. But first here came Manny running towards Michael, helmet gone, mask gone, as happy as Michael had ever seen him as he jumped into Michael's arms, nearly knocking him over. Then the rest of the Clippers came running from all corners of Macomb Dam Park, and, from, and Ellie was out there with them, and Carlos. And just for one moment, Michael closed his eyes like he was talking, taking a picture of it all. This wasn't the whole dream, but he had to admit it would sure do for now.